to go ahead and start. I hope you all know that this is being recorded and uh, we're welcoming you to Critical Connections. Our, our uh, mission is to encourage and enhance critical discourse in the field of ceramics, just so you all know. And I uh, sent out Janet's website and I think we all know Janet or know about her. She's an international figure and I'm really proud to welcome her here today. Thank you so much for being here, Janet. I'll Thank turn you. it over to you. Right. I'll see whether this works still actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. And you might want to do um so if you just want to see if you don't want to see all the stuff. I might want to do slideshow just with the with the um, menu up here. Oh, I'll just do it like that. They can see. You, we've got it. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to do a full screen, do a oh. slideshow. I think if you um, go up and say start slideshow, it will do it. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find. Because it doesn't have the. There, go see at the at the top there. It says slideshow. Yeah. yeah. Right start. there you go. Okay. <gasps> Yay! Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Good job. Okay. okay. <laughs> now while Janet is talking, if everyone would mute, it would be great. Okay. Um, I thought that I would. Um, start by um, talking a little bit about my practice. Um, I'm obviously not at my studio in the mountains because um, I don't actually have Wi-Fi in the studio. Um, and that's quite a conscious decision because it's too distracting to actually um, to have access there. Um, so, I've made this slideshow which starts off with um, a history of my practice and then um, a shorter section which is um, the place that I actually work in and um, what I do uh, when I'm making work. So I called it looking, wondering, reacting, repetition and time. Where does an idea come from? Because I think that those things, looking closely, thinking about things and reacting is very much the way that I work. And I frequently find myself going back and picking up ideas that I've worked with before and doing them in the light of new understandings. A lot of my practice in the past um, has centered around my engagement in China. And initially I was invited to um, an official, it was a, a first symposium for Western potters in Yixing, where they make the Bishaware teapots, those small unglazed teapots. Um, it was my first time in China. It was an extraordinary experience. And it was in the mid nineties. And um, China has changed a great deal since then, as have we. And from that, first experience, I formed a relationship with uh, a Professor Zhang Shizhe, who is the man who is uh, in the maroon shirt on the left of this photo. Um, he was, he had been uh, a lecturer in charge of ceramics at Tsinghua University when it was the uh, Central Academy of Art and Design. Nobel Patsy. Ah, it's all right, it was just a message. And um, he subsequently became uh, an advisor to the central government on ceramics. Um, to be in a country where there is such a thing as an advisor to the central government on ceramics, to me is a source of wonder. And Zhang Shouzhe was very, very generous and we got on extremely well and he opened doors for me and continued to do so. And very sadly, he died last year 
year before last. Um, and sadly, of course, I couldn't go to his funeral. This is my home in the mountains um, outside Canberra. Um, it has a large dam in front of it. And it's a very long building that was initially built just as a pottery, um, not as a house. And subsequently, when the production pottery was uh, discontinued, um, we moved into that and, and lived in it as a house, subdivided some of the area into rooms. I get a lot of solace looking out on the dam and watching the changing seasons. I have a lot of uh, water lilies, uh, white ones and pink ones, that have grown from two plants my mother gave me. So they're very much part of my memories of her. Um, the wildlife is abundant. Um, that's Kevin the King Parrot. Um, and the kangaroo that's behind him uh, is one of the older male kangaroos that seem to take up residence at our place. They come there to die, which is a bit sad, but um, they, they're usually old and they're usually a little bit flea bitten. I think they've probably lost out to younger bloods and they, they just have a very calm existence. I've always been fascinated by Australian flora and the weirdness of it. Um, my initial training was as a botanist, and I think that that actually opens your eye to the oddness of our flora. I'm also a rescuer of wildlife and um, not a carer because that, that's really hard work, but um, rescuing small um, animals. And it gives you the opportunity to observe them very closely. This is a Banksia species, one of our very popular plants. Um, a wallaby with her young in her pouch. And birds, um, I feed the birds still. The cockatoos are a source of, um, of great pain because I love them, but they're eating my house. They're very funny, they're clowns. I like the reflections on the water when it's very, very um, still. And I like the way that you actually have images reversed. And that kind of reversal of images, um, this is a reflection as you can see, um, is very, very important to me because I think what it does is it puts a filter between yourself and reality and enables you to see things without necessarily um, seeing them in a literal way. The kitchen sink, um, rather than a source of drudgery, is a place of great wonder. Initially, um, I had been teaching and I had always wanted to run a production pottery. And so for 15 years, I ran with my partner a production pottery there. He was building the building, was not a potter. And it was a very successful business because I think we had people coming from two different places. One looked from the outside at a pottery business and kept saying, but why would you do that? And I said, well, that's what potters always do. And he would say, but that doesn't make any sense. So we did a lot of things that were unusual at the time. Um, we only wholesaled. We didn't have anybody come to the studio. Um, we had minimum wholesale orders. It was really run on quite business-like lines. And they actually worked, which was a source of wonder to me. Um, <clears throat> I was also shocked at how big the building was because we both did sketches of what we thought a pottery should look like. And mine was a regular little rectangular building. Michael's was this large curved <laughs> building following the um, contours of the land and very large. And I said, but it's so big. And he said, I don't know any of your friends who've said, gee, I wish I didn't build my pottery so big. And so we had, we had plenty of room to move and we started to run residential summer schools there as well each summer. We also did um, a line of production wear 
that was not functional, not domestic wear. Um, these dry glazed jars came in littered or unlittered. They were quite unromantically described as uh, very small, small, one eighth, one quarter, one half and large, depending upon how much of a bag of clay they used. So a quarter, size a quarter was a quarter bag of clay, size a half was a half bag of clay, etc. They were very successful and they made a very large proportion of our income and they satisfied a desire to throw and continue to explore form and shape without having to adhere to the strictures of functional pottery. But it did make me wonder about why functional pottery or domestic pottery, as I preferred to call it, seemed to attract lower prices, was harder to make often than sculptural work, um, and it wasn't regarded as highly. And so I did a series then that was called Memories of the Domestic Life, Framing Function, which was looking at how, as things pass through a kind of a filter of art appreciation, they change in their value, both their um, intellectual value and their monetary value. And I thought, I wonder if you reverse that. So the thing that is immediate and to hand is the sculptural version and the thing that's on the wall and untouchable is the usable one. Does it change the way we perceive things? I also did a series of teapots. It was in the era of making teapots that were about teapots and cups that were about cups. And um, people didn't see these as teapots. And I asked somebody why, and they said, well, they haven't got a lid, so it can't be a teapot. And so I found if I put a flange on the inside of these, I didn't want to put a lid on them, but if I put a flange on the inside that suggested there had been a lid, then it was okay. People saw them as teapots. This is a piece called um, Memories of the Domestic Life. And the bottom five cups are exactly the shapes that um, our production line teacups were. And then as you move to the apex of the triangle, the pieces became progressively less functional. The second top uh, tier were just cutouts like stage flats. Um, we were living at the coast at the time and I'd always gathered shells and they started to acquire some of the characteristic of those white bony remnants of shells that you find. They looked really nice, but they weren't very functional. Um, they tended to fall over sometimes because of the small bases and the very, very large amount of clay that went into the handles and the ridges. I was asked to be in a show called Process and Obsession, and it was about how you can get involved in the making and that the making becomes the most important part. I threw, this is the second iteration of that work. <clears throat> the first one was at the performance space in Sydney. And I threw hundreds and hundreds of bowls and completely covered the floor um, of the exhibition area with them. I worked with a filmmaker friend and a musician friend and they filmed very close up um, making, making pots and throwing them and recorded me talking about them and then manipulated, digitally manipulated my voice so that there was this very, very repetitive, um, soothing music um, sound that was covering it. What was interesting for me in that is that time became a factor in the work because as I made the bowls and they were called performance bowls, um, that was generally how we referred to them, and in the end, how I sold them. Um, they changed, and I could tell Monday bowls from Friday bowls because inevitably when you're doing the same action over and over again, you unconsciously make adjustments. And so it was really interesting for me to see how time could become a factor in form. <clears throat> um, just to go back to that one, this was the second iteration, as I said, 
<clears throat> and at the time that this work was shown, um, digital projection had happened. The first time it was uh, VHS tape with a huge big VHS player. player. But then it became um, a digital projection. And what happened was that the bowl started to look less real under the digital projection as well. I went to a symposium in Hawaii. I was shocked at how much polystyrene we used and how much garbage we made. And so I did a series of works that were reflections on use using all of the disposable things. I would go through the garbage bins because there wasn't recycling at the time and pull out all of the cups and wash them carefully. Um, and then did a series of works of this kind. Um, an exhibition uh, of work that was very much drawn from those first performance bowls because I started to work with um, porcelain after that because I wanted to do some works that were de demonstrably different to all of the bowls on the floor. And so I thought, well, I've got to use porcelain because that's the special material. And um, the pieces became looser and looser, of course, because porcelain doesn't stand up so well. So I played a game with the clay and the pieces got very, very wobbly. Um, and, and that became the nature of the work so that it was very much about the act of throwing. These, this is a piece where the shelves that I put up are actually increasingly tilted towards the bottom, which was alarming um, for the gallery owner, but I had very, very good museum wax. <clears throat> and this is the work. They were very, very finely thrown um, translucent uh, porcelain. Initially, I used an English porcelain, and then I switched to using um, an Australian porcelain, which was really more like a plastic bone china. From the performance space piece, I started to do works that were collected works. So I realized when I did, had done one piece that was about teapots, um, that when you make a teapot, it stands for every teapot in some respects that you've ever made. So I did these pieces that were called vases, but they were in fact made up of multiple bottles that each could have a flower in them. I felt also that they were a little bit like domestic wear in that, and they are domestic wear, of course, in that the user could actually choose how many bottles stayed in the tray in the same way that we change the way we use sets um, of functional pottery. I started doing sets that were collected on the tray and suggesting what they might be used for. My friend in China, Professor Zhang Shizhe, he said, I should work at a factory, a bone china factory in China. And so I did. Um, and I sent them some sketches of work, photos of work as well, and traveled there myself. And it was in Shandong province. I arrived there and nine days later, they had made models, they had made molds, they had cast them. It was very, very like production pottery, you know, it was just like the shelves in my studio with all the cups and all the mugs, everything lined up pointing in the same direction. And this was what resulted nine days later. Um, I was astonished at the speed of it. I was also surprised at how uh, stiff it became once it had gone through all those processes. I worked with a different factory in China that worked, made um, porcelain and um, I gave them uh, a piece of mine to uh, model and they made molds of it, but the top of the, my thrown pieces were at an angle. And of course you can't actually cast an angle like that easily. And so each of the tops of these had to be cut by hand. As soon as a hand was involved, the pieces acquired a liveliness that they didn't when there wasn't a hand involved. I used those pieces, the bone china pieces that were made to start exploring 
other things, it, you know, what makes a set? If I put a bone china pourer in with a teapot of mine and make it a set, if I call it a set, is it such? And have I made the pourers? What's going on? In the factory. So I started making things <laughs> that questioned what was actually um, made by me. Who is the author? of that who owns the the making this was the final work and it was at a okay. uh, show in Enseca and um, well is it, is are included, you going to paint the back next century um, okay. it, um how's it I'm sorry um oh, okay <laughs> I can hear another voice how, um, um the pieces that were um, completely covered with this decal. I used a decal that was an English one because I have a British heritage and I felt that using Chinese ones didn't make sense. It's called Summertime Rose. It was out of copyright, um, but it turned up in uh, a local uh, supermarket where they have cheap bone china imports and there it was, my decal, my summertime rose. So I actually took some of those mass-produced cups and made them part of the set. Is it still part of a set if it's something that's made somewhere else, if it's made by somebody else, if it actually ties in? If we look at set theory as a mathematical thing, the objects of the set only have to have one characteristic in common to be part of a set. Can we say the same thing about domestic wear? Working with decoration like this, I found myself all the time trying to keep the decoration restrained, trying to keep it under control. So I did some pieces that were about controlling the decoration, drawing a black ring and trying to corral the decoration in one spot. But I found as I did this, as I did subsequent pieces doing the same thing, the decoration got away. So I made work that was about that escaping of decoration from your control, giving yourself over to it. And this was the entropy series. I used both thrown pieces and factory produced pieces. Professor Zhang Shouzhe and I, we worked together on many occasions, but we never actually made work together. And he suggested that we actually do a collaboration. Working with his assistant, I would design the form and he would do the decoration. These were the forms that we made. It was called a coffee pot in Chinese descriptions. We worked with paper, sticking bits onto them. We had a desk in the factory to work at. And this was the re resulting set. It was called Harmony, um, a desirable characteristic in uh, a Confucian society, which China is. It was launched at one of the ceramic industry conferences, the National Ceramic Industry Conferences. Work was acquired by the National Museum and other museums in China. And it was very interesting. We were like film stars. Um, I can't even begin to imagine being like a film star connected with ceramics in Australia. Of course, it had a lot to do with the connection with a very well-regarded man in China, but it's the medium itself that got that honour. I also used to take part in an annual show that was doing uh, a year of the, whatever the zodiac year was, and um, made the pieces in the form of the animal. It was really important to me that they always worked as well. And these were the year of the rat teapots. Uh, this was the year of the ox teapot. Um, I went to judge a show and do some workshops in uh, South Africa. And as a response to that, started doing my Out of Africa series, simply because the cups reminded me of zebras. Um, as simple as that, and started working with black and white. Once I 
started on any kind of decoration, I found it very hard to stop. This is a, what was called um, part of the Ridiculous series. Uh, it's a ridiculous vase. So it's based on that same plain white vase, but I was having an exhibition and the gallery had anticipated everything would be plain white. And the gallery owner has said, we should call the show Sublime. And I couldn't think of me making anything that you could call Sublime. And so I thought I've got to do something to counter that. So I did this ridiculous series as well. So it was the sublime and the ridiculous. Again, the owner of this could choose how they used the bottles, what they put in them, how many. Um, I went to Kanazawa in Japan. And so of course, when I came back, I had to do after Kanazawa series. I always found the best way to understand a country was to try and make work that used some of the qualities in the uh, ceramics. It was understanding the world through ceramics. These are pieces um, that I did after I did a workshop with Alona Romul, who is a very, very well-known um, artist, known particularly for her anglaise decoration. Um, she came as a visiting artist to school and I took a class with her. She used a technique that I'd not seen before, which is using a pen uh, with China paint. And that really appealed to me. I've never been much of a painter, but I do like graphics. I went to uh, Fuping in China, um, which is a residency at a factory outside the town of Fuping, Fule, uh, craft workshops. And, um, they make Sijo wear, uh, replicas of Sijo wear. And I found that every time I started to do decoration of Australian flora, I'd start scratching away at the surface and I would find China underneath it. I would think I was doing something new and then suddenly I would find in a museum exactly what I'd been doing. So then I make work scratching the surface, peeling back the surface. Back in Australia, um, I was invited to be part of a program called the Remote Community Ceramics Network, which worked with Indigenous artists, bringing them together. It was initiated by the artists themselves with the help of a colleague, Jeff Crispin. And it, I was invited largely because I was involved um, with a university and it was an opportunity for the artist to come into an art school and work. So these are all fairly familiar things. And it started to affect the colours and the decoration that I did on the work. I also went out with the artist to find um, Terra Sigillata. And we made Terra Sigillata and introduced them to that. Um, which they really, really love because, of course, it is their country. The artists came to my school, the Australian National University, and worked there as well. Artists from different communities who had different ceramic styles. This is um, uh, saltwater work from the north of Australia, from an island just off Darwin, um, Tiwi Islands. And so they used a lot of imagery that is uh, marine. This is from Central Australia, um, a, a community called Ernabella. Um, and this is Scrofito into the Terra Sigillata, using traditional storytelling and also a non-representational pattern that's known as Ernabella Walker. We also ran classes for kids and men even joined in because it's quite gender separ separated. And this is one of the senior men, um, Pepe Carroll, Pepe Jungler Carroll. The most recent workshop I did was in um, Alice Springs for the town camps. Uh, a lot of the camps uh, are on the fringes of towns and it was run for International Women's Day and it was uh, by the Family Safety Group. And these are the uh, main women in the family safety group. 
and they're wearing um, T-shirts that they designed with pictures of themselves taken from photos. I started doing a series also called the Tree Vase series. Um, I'd made a Christmas tree because we didn't have one um, on the left. And um, I'd been given a lot of little bits of decorations and whatnot. And so I made this tree on the left that was to have sticks stuck in it. I'd also loved um, pandanus palms for a long time. And I inverted that. I did some vases that were after the bushfires. We had bushfires go through our property. And um, after tr eucalypt trees have burnt, after gum trees have burnt, you get all of this adventitious growth out of the side and I, there was nothing else to put in vases. So I made vases that were about that regrowth. And this was a, a tree vase that developed out of those initial ideas and out of the pandanus. Um, I think this one's in the National Gallery. I think that one is. I used Ilona's method of um, drawing with China paints to draw on the surface of the pots. I used terra sigillata, went back to a plain white. I did Chinese birds that had magpies on the other side and did a series of um, works, uh, one set of which went to the American Museum of Tableware, I think it is, in Michigan. Um, and it was called, it was for a show called High Chair Fine Dining. And it was about, um, new ceramics for kids to use. And so this is the Where's the Magpie Wear, uh, which included also a plastic cup and a texture pen, um, knowing the joy of, of drawing on things with indelible pens, and also included a shot glass and a short black coffee cup for the presiding, presiding officer. <clears throat> I refined the Scratching the Surface series peeling back what I thought was Australian. I did hybridizing sets that transferred from more Australian to more Chinese. What I was trying to do was to make a kind of work that was culturally specific and yet borderless. I worked with the Terra Sigillata doing imagery that moved from one to the other. I tried doing cell division to see whether or not I could talk about it that way. It was all still the same idea, but just trying different ways that it might actually um, be articulate. I also made laser decals um, of pots themselves and put pots on pots in the same way that this work has pots on pots. Um, and I used to play a game with myself to see how many pots I could hide on one pot. I'd always liked fish. Um, I was invited to Korea and um, I was invited to um, make some work um, with a Korean artist who worked in traditional Bunjong style and also in Celadon uh, glaze, Karayo uh, Celadon wares. And so I made decals of my pots and put them on the Celadon pieces. I did some pieces that were more um, botanical illustration type, but this was not my love. And I found myself constantly coming back to domestic wear. Um, a company in Italy um, wanted to make some of my work. It was not a success because they insisted upon doing it in Italy and it was so expensive. In Fuping, I also worked with a master potter who um, made flowers and uh, decorated with three-dimensional decoration. And I did a joint piece with her where she would make a Chinese flower and I would make Australian flowers. This was the finished piece. 
In Korea also, I tried to release the decoration from the pots and so the fish and the ducks became 3D items. Sorry, that's repeating. Um, I worked with Celadon also um, at the China Academy of Art in Hangzhou and that led me to work some more with Celadon, um, talking with people about Celadon, looking at old wares. This is a, a funerary uh, urn of mine from the uh, Song Dynasty. They were very, very common, um, but I've always loved them. I was invited to a Celadon res residency at Shang Yu uh, Research Center and um, was wanting to actually work with Celadon and see if it was possible to use it in that same hybridized way. way. Uh, I also worked later at um, a, another center in the, for the Liling Valley uh, Ceramic Museum. I did a lot of tests. I've always done lots of tests. I look at work in museums, historic work, I look at work in factories. <clears throat> I worked with a master, Xu, Celadon master. I made my cups. I always make cups when I go away. It's a kind of grounding. I looked at things that Celadon was meant to be like. This is the surrounds where the residency was. I looked at different kinds of Celadon. There was one called apple green. And I thought, oh, there's no apple I've seen that's that color. A plum green, I should say, plum green. No plum I've seen. But then the next day I was brought plums and they were indeed that green. The green of grasshoppers and stick insects, more tests, using the terrasigillata from home with the celadon from China. Um, I did some work that was about um, global warming and about rising water levels. Using traditional hands from uh, female dancing statues, and these are called not waving but drowning, and they're based on the funerary jar. and glazed in as many celadons as I could get. Janet, we're getting, to, we're getting into our discussion time. Uh, okay. okay, I'll go through this very quickly. I still did some work, but what happened was recently after COVID, because for two, over two years I hadn't been able to travel anywhere, I found I couldn't make work that was like that. And I made started making this work, which was, um, about how I was losing it, it was fading. Um, and it was the only kind of work that I could do. I found myself unable to do anything. So the imagery became very faded. And uh, a writer uh, who was writing a catalog essay said about it, um, that it was, it was an erasure of those influences from my work. Um, and talked about the sadness of it, which I felt also. And then this work came out of it. This is called Getting Lost, because I felt lost last year. Using the same things, but doing tableaus and making functional work. Very quick studio walkthrough. I have a lot of stuff in my place. <laughs> in the kitchen, shadows I look at, shadows of birds, shadows of plants. A chair I sit in and think, a chair I sit in and look, shadows. In the absence of flowers, This is the stuff. This is part of my life now too. 
It hasn't yet come out in pots. <laughs> this is what we call the gallery room at home. You walk through that, more, more pots, more stuff, more paintings. Have a collection of yeasting pots. I have a friend who made some lotus feet um, because I collected slippers. She gave me one to go with them. This is the corridor to the studio where I make work. And along the corridor, there's more stuff. So I walk past this each day. This is the studio. This is where I throw. I work. I can look out. I don't have Wi-Fi. I have different terracial artists that I keep refining all the time. I'm constantly testing because I'm now using a different clay, making different sorts of work. I'm doing different kinds of tests. Through the doors to a big undercover area, which for residential schools was good. I have large sliding doors. Uh, Neighbours like my place for street parties <laughs> and the kilns are behind the sliding doors. These days, nearly all the work I make is produced out of this little electric kiln, which just about runs on the solar power. Sorry, that's bye bye to the women. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Very good, Janet. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about that. Um, you can go up and, and hit stop screen sharing. Yes, I'm just screen sharing, stop share. Very okay. good, very good. I have a question from something you said early on just to start the discussion. Um, if I were writing about your work, I would really want to know about this. You said you were making work that was culturally specific, but borderless. Would right. you elaborate on that a little more? Okay, I, I wanted to talk about the different places where I was or the cultures that I bumped up against. Um, I've always, in, in a lot of respects, I'm an outsider to those cultures, but you bump up against them and you work in them. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was to have decorations or forms or shapes that were from the ceramics of that culture or from the artwork of that culture because Australian uh, Aborigines do, don't have any Indigenous uh, pottery practice at all. But to look at things and uh, so people would look at them and say, oh, that looks Chinese or that looks Aboriginal or that looks something else. So it would kind of look a bit like it enough to give those kind of clues, but not be so specific that it was copying it, that it was bouncing up against something else. But that border was a very, very fluid and permeable membrane. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And it's really hybridizing. Pardon? It's essentially a kind of hybridizing. Yeah. Yeah, which is what happens to us as we travel, happens yes. internally and, and then it comes out externally uh, yes. in, in your work. And, um, and then in your work, I see you coming back to these forms and, mm. and processes, but then um, making work that, that fits into a little, a different niche you know, uh, yes. like yeah, what you, you... In response. I think I'm a responsive artist rather than one who, you know, stuff just kind of blossoms up and pops out. Um, I need to have that input. First mm -hmm. of all, I need to have a question. I use making pots to find the answers to questions that I have. Um, I worked uh, in a collaborative project with a colleague recently who's a sculptor and we had a sh an exhibition together. And initially we were go each going to go to the other's 
other country. She spent a lot of time in Thailand where I had not spent much time. And I spent a lot of time in China where she had not been. And we were going to each travel to the other's other country and introduce one another to that culture and to people we knew there. And then we would come back here and we would make work. That, that was the plan before COVID. And what we did was we came to my studio. <laughs> so she did work about traveling along the road in the bush. <laughs> And I did nothing because I didn't, I didn't have anything to really make work about until when we had made some work. And when we were talking at the exhibition opening, um, I eventually came, started making work at the end, which was about that being frozen and everything fading. Um, and she, she, we were asked, what, was, what did we learn about each other's practice? And I said, well, that we have quite different ways of working. And Wendy chimed in and she said, yes, well, you could call my way a kind of a professional artist way where I go to the studio each day and I make work and I think about what I've done and, you know, make work the next day based on that and all the rest of it. And she said, and Janet, well, Janet's style of working is what I'd call the Amish barn method of working, which is nothing, nothing, nothing for a long time, no barn, no barn, no barn, and then you blink and there's a barn. <laughs> so I quite liked that. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it was a bit like that. Anna? Ah. You're muted. That, but she's, Anna, she's, she's Anna you're muted. Me. She knows she's muted. Anna. <laughs> here I am. So, okay, it, it's not breakfast time here. So there's rosé wine in my cup. It's just, you know. Just to... <laughs> and, and I've been so lucky to have traveled many times in China with Janet. We're, we're traveling buddies in China. And, uh, and of course, both of us are, are feeling this withdrawal symptom of not being able to get to China. And yes, we so my question to you time. is, so the gates open and they say, OK, everybody, you can come now and COVID's in control in China and don't worry about your visa. Where would you go in China? Um, at the moment, I've got so used to not going to China. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be mainly to visit friends would be first of all would be my first thing because there's people I miss terribly yeah, um, yeah for sure for and sure. in the end it's about people um yeah so I would go back and I'd see all the people at the factory in Zibor mm -hmm. um I would see friends in Shanghai and Jingdu Jin and Beijing Hangzhou very good friends in Hangzhou yeah and yeah. so yes it's about people i think um but our our government or our last government we have a new one our last government was so wonderful on china diplomacy i don't think that anybody from australia will be allowed to china for a very long time <laughs> yeah no we've managed it extraordinarily badly mm. other questions <clears throat> It's, oh, I hate to ask this, but what is that name of that porcelain you're using from um, Australia? Southern Ice. Oh, yeah. It's a mother, That's, isn't it? It's pretty tough to work with. I think we can get it here. It's actually very easy to throw. That's why I say it's like a plastic bone oh. child. It has, um, it has, it's highly fluxed, but it also has extremely plastic bentonite-like clays mixed in it that are not Australian you know let's be honest they're not Australian it's made in Australia but uh, there are imported ingredients because we have such old geology in Australia almost nothing is sparkle white you know everything has got mm -hmm. um, titanium in it or a little bit of iron because it's such an old worn down geology 
Yeah, you have to have pointy mountains to have white, white plains. We all of ours around. Yeah. Uh, but it's does Janet have a there's a question retrospective publication um I I wrote some glazed books early in my career um and for a long time I was known as the glazed lady um and people were surprised to find I made pots um <laughs> there has been such a resurgence of interest in um in pottery making you know you know not just ceramics but particularly pottery and people are now getting interested in making glazes again that the little book that I first wrote which was just a recipe book for Australian potters it was called uh, very poetically glazes for Australian potters um, it was starting to fetch prices well over $200 on eBay oh. just nuts and so uh, a young woman in Melbourne said to me that um, I should do a facsimile reprint of it. And um, so she said she would scan it and do it all. So she did. And she kept bossing me around. Uh, so it happened. So there's yeah, a facsimile reprint of the book. It's not a new publication. It's just a copy of the old one. Yeah. Um, I know. Still good. So, okay. still good. Go ahead. What? I just said it's still good. Still good. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, uh, several years ago, when I was publishing um, Ceramics Art and Perception, we had an article on your work. And um, at that time, I first noticed the change in your color palette to uh -huh. the earth tones. And I thought that it may have been um, the Aboriginal influence. Um, Did that happen before you you were involved with the Aboriginal communities? I think, I mean, I think that there has always been, I've always liked that palette. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when I uh, first started pottery, when I was training, um, it was a very Anglo-Oriental school that I trained in. And... Um, you know, Celadons, and there was sort of a lot of uh, semi-matte irony glazes always appealed to me. I, for many years, I wood-fired, um, but I'm a reformed wood-firer. I have not <laughs> wood-fired now in, um, I think, 20-something years, 25 or 30 years I haven't wood-fired, but um, I've always liked that sort of um, surface. Mm -hmm. I really like Terra Sigillata. I, um, I love the Mesoamerican ceramics um, and South uh, American ceramics that use Terra Sigillata. I like the Greek attic ware that uses Terra Sigillata. Mm -hmm. I like that thin skin that's not quite a glaze, but I, I fire it much higher than it should be fired. Um, if I wanted a high shine on it, um, I would fire it much lower, but I much prefer that integration with the clay body. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I took clays from all over. But it was driving out to one of the remote communities. You know how when clay dries in a clay pan or a dam or a pond, you get that shiny layer and it cracks with a sort of curved, cracked uh, parts. And... Um, that was terra sigillata. So I went out with the ladies the next day with egg slices and we used the egg slices just to lift off the terra sigillata. So we actually got quite a high yield because we weren't using all the underclay. And that actually led me also to develop a technique that I've never heard of anybody else using, which is when you make the terra sigillata, you don't discard the, the sediment I actually settle it several times, but you use that as an undercoat. And what it does is it makes the surface smooth and even, fills in any little holes, um, makes it tight, not as tight as with the true terra sigillata. Then you put that just like a thin varnish, really, over the surface. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that means that you can get the kind of density of color that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's it's very much um, the the indigenous um, communities that I work with. They responded to it, you know, because as I said, it's their country mm -hmm. and it's their color, and I respond to their use of it because. You know, I was showing them how they might use it and then they would use it. And I would do my own work while I was out there. I never actually did classes teaching or anything like that. I'm like a hired gun um, that solves technical problems. But I would do my own work out there. And what would happen is that um, I would find, come in in the morning in a pot that I'd started, I'd applied terracing art all over, waiting for me to decorate it, would have one of the artist's names on the bottom. And then they would do an infinitely superior decoration on the surface. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I learned from that just by some of the things that they did. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But and I think Antra, Antra, Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Antra had her hand raised here with a question. I am totally interested in what Janet wanted to finish with, if that's okay, and then yeah. I'll. I'll go ahead with my question. Oh, no, I was just talking about that. Um, so it ended up being a kind of two-way thing. Um, we learned from each other. And that was one of the reasons why this project, the Remote Communities Ceramics Network, got Indigenous communities together because there's no Indigenous ceramic tradition, you know, other than using it uh, in ochre form mm -hmm. painting on barks and on bodies in the community i've worked most with what they do is they draw in the sand so it's really ephemeral they draw in the sand and then they use a stick like a windscreen wiper to wipe out that chapter and then go on with the next <laughs> part and in fact i have a beautiful photo we took some of the artists to the big pot factory in jingdujen and um have a beautiful photograph where uh, one of them um uh, Jimpin was working and she'd created quite a lot of coloured dust on the ground underneath. They were working with very big pots and she started drawing with her finger in that as if she was drawing in sand and she was doing it just unconsciously and it's the most beautiful photo. Yeah. That's wonderful. Go ahead, Antra, with your yes. question. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Janet. Um, I am really... Um, amazed at, of course, the, the whole journey of work that you've done. And I really loved Elaine's question because I kind of thought that you had worked with the um, Indigenous people in Australia. And I totally am interested in, um, in a question about that, um, but also loved the fact that you have solar panels and that you're firing your kiln with that. So it's almost. almost. On okay. A day, on a sunny day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think that I am interested in knowing the nuances of it. Like when you say almost, um, if it's okay to ask, what cone are you firing up to? And if you are, if you happen to start with a bright sunny day and it says that that's the forecast, but if it Start, happens to be cloudy there's just one cloud that is not giving you the the wattage yes. how are you managing that um use of energy i i also have mains power mm -hmm. i don't have i don't have a battery um when they installed my solar panels and it's quite a big array it's a 7.5 um, megawatt um array which mm -hmm. is quite big for a you know, it's essentially a domestic installation. Um, but they said to wait to get a battery because the technology in batteries is changing so fast and the price will come down. Well, it hasn't come down very much. Not yet. Um, no, not yet. But I also get a reasonable feed-in tariff to the main grid. So I'm getting credit for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. So it's not... I haven't done all the sums yet, but I did do um, for a period just watch the power usage. And I actually, I was doing firings in the kiln and it was summertime. Um, and it, uh, I actually had a slight surplus. I got a credit on my electricity bill. 
yeah. It was summertime though, so no electric heating or anything like that. Mm. Right. Thank you, Janet. Yes, Leonard Smith is the person in Australia who has, um, uh, he, he and Steve Harrison um, have really, really gone into um, uh, solar energy for firing kilns. And um, Steve publishes stuff on his own website, but <clears throat> Leonard responds quite often to those um, ceramic uh, groups that have questions about things you know he'll often respond you know, quite fully is Leonard is he using solar uh yes yes okay that's great yes yes and he also has an electric car oh good for him He's at the moment on a marathon cross-country bike ride oh my gosh huh well thank you I loved seeing, we're going to have to close here, but I loved seeing this, I don't know how you pronounce it, <laughs> the, the difference of your work, but, and these, these little tangents, like the work that you did when you were um, down with COVID, the surfaces so different from the translucent fluid surfaces of your other work. So I see these, these tangents, but also the continuity in your work is mm. almost as if it just changes clothes. Mm. <laughs> you know, your voice comes through. So the, the uh, you know, you're talking about the, the cultural, but the borderless and the cultural um, specific, but the borderless. But you're, you've done such a wonderful job of your own voice always being there. Thank you. So that, Thank yeah. you very much. Beautiful. Mm. And I have one of your little tea sets from um, Zibo. All right. Yes. And um, I have your a little shot glass that matches Anna's cup. Right. <laughs> I think from yes. the Trianale or something. Yes, <laughs> yeah yeah and um there are some nice comments in the chat so as always i'll send out the chat and uh any other comments are welcome any other comments for janet yes i haven't uh there are any questions there i haven't um i will also um i'll give you some links to other interviews i've done okay and um also, um, I think I can use it to send privately. I did a demonstration of using Terra Sigillata for the ceramic school, for the ceramic congress. Okay. And um, that video I own, although I can't, you know, sell rights to it to publish, but I think I can provide it to people independently. Yeah. At least parts of it. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Great to see full, you. Full demonstration is on the um, Ceramic School website. Oh. Great. 